those of you who uh, joined last month's meeting and or uh, read through the uh, entire message in the, the emails, we've gone to a, a slightly different format from the previous uh, webinar format. So we're going for a much more interactive format. Um, so please participate, um, raise a hand or just speak up. I think most people are able to speak. Uh, keep an eye on the participants list. Um, just a heads up, so we're recording the Zoom and we'll put the recording up um, with a, you know, a link to it via the webinars channel and on the www.nursc page uh, about the NUG monthly meeting. Uh, also encourage people to chat away in the NERSC user Slack. Um, we have a hashtag webinars channel um, that's intended sort of, you know, for this. Um, the advantage of using the Slack is that we can continue the conversation beyond the Zoom meeting and also sort of, uh, you know, records things. And uh, after the meeting in the next day or so, I'll uh, jo uh, add a summary into that channel of, uh, yeah, interesting things that came out of this meeting. So our agenda, kind of regular agenda for the um, for this meeting is start out with a, a win of the month and then a today I learned uh, section. We'll explain those in a minute. Uh, go through some announcements. Uh, and then the topic of the day for this month is going to be the C Scratch 1 crash, which uh, I'm sure has uh, yeah, dominated people's imagination at the, the beginning of this month and uh, attention. Uh, then we'll just go through some um, yeah, yeah, coming meetings and last month's numbers. So the idea of the win of the month section is for yeah, our users to show off an achieve achievement or shout out an achievement of somebody else that you know of. Uh, you know, things like had a, yeah, having a paper accepted, um, solving a bug that had been giving you some grief. Um, yeah, it can be something quite big, like a, a scientific achievement. Um, yeah, this is a, a good uh, source to yeah, nominate something as a, uh, a candidate for a science highlight or a uh, high impact scientific achievement award or innovative use of high computing award. And what we're interested in hearing is, yeah, what you did, what, what you achieved. Yeah, tell us your success and, and what was the key insight that came from it. I think people can just unmute themselves and speak. Uh, does anybody have a win of the month they'd like to show off? So I have one as a, a bit of a, a shout out to one of our users. Um, the new docs.nurse.gov site, I guess not that new anymore, is hosted on GitLab and users can contribute. You can make a, you know, if you spot something missing or um, a correction to make, you can make a merge request and submit it. And uh, you know, during our C Scratch issues, we had our first user contributed merge request came in through GitLab. Um, so yeah, shout out to uh, Torin Bechtel, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who spotted some missing information on our current issues page and posted a merge request that we were then able to just uh, merge in. And yeah, that was, uh, uh, you know, a timely um, contribution to docs. And yeah, we encourage everybody else to do the same when you yeah, see things that could be added to or corrected from our docs. Uh, it's at, um, uh, what's the site? nersc.gitlab.io. I'll paste that in the chat. Hi, um, this is uh, Koichi from Pinnell. I don't, Hi, can you hear me? Hi, hi Steve. Yeah. I don't have any particular, you know, innovations, but this month was a small thing. I just started more. It's actually using uh, the Slack of NASC users. Um, yep. I, I more started more, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, often using this in the past several weeks and I found it quite nice uh, to see what's going on in the community, particularly when I have some issues like logging, logging in, in, in the, uh, the NASC machine, then and just look at the track and how are people doing, if it's just unique 
problem to me or everyone's having. So uh, I wonder how how many people or users are using this Slack uh, Nask channel, and uh, do they usually use in, in inside a web browser, or it's more typical to download its app? It's more like a question, though. So I'm, I'm quite yeah. interested about what other people do, but uh, personally, I, I use the Slack app. But, um, I quite like it, and I have quite a lot of Slack organizations I and see. channels lined up on it. Um, yeah, it is good to see that the um, general channel and a few others seem to be reasonably active. I heard um, apparently a, a lot of the activity is actually in direct uh, messages, you know, private messages between users. So uh, users are finding it a good way to communicate sort of amongst yeah, amongst user teams, basically. I see, yeah, okay. I, I haven't done that too much, but it's already, it's kind of helpful for me, just, just looking at those channels and streams. So, yeah. Yeah, that's um, good to hear. Yep. Yeah, we. I'm Peter Maris, and we're using the Slack channel as a private channel on the NERSC users a lot for uh, a hackathon preparation for Perlmutter. I'm, I'm the PI on a, on a NISAP uh, for, for Perlmutter. Ah, yep. That's a, yeah, that sounds good. Good luck for the uh, for the hackathon work. Ah, uh, taint easy. Yeah. <laughs> Takes a, it takes a bit of a run up, but but you can have quite a you know a good uh, effect with these intense um, activities. Yep, that's true, and I appreciate the help I'm getting. That's great, thanks. Um, okay, so then the other side of the coin is today I learned, and and this is a a opportunity to talk about something that happened or that you discovered that surprised you that you know, might be a benefit to other users and uh, you know, incidentally might also you know, give us some tips for improving our documentation, things that we could uh, call out or make more obvious. Um, so for example, so so this is, you know, this doesn't have to be a success, this can be an I'm stuck on something. Um, yeah, so yeah, something that you got stuck on, a, a dead end, something that you really thought was the case and on further debugging turned out not to be true and that, that leads to a tip. Um, new, new tips you've discovered for using NERSC or, or, or something external that you've discovered that might benefit other NERSC users, you know, a, a good um, presentation, for instance, that you saw. So uh, um, this is Robbie again. One thing I found um, when um, we had to move to like the GPFS file systems because of the test issues and whatnot was that um, we have one file system uh, dedicated to JDI, but, but it's basically a read only file system. And I found that um, reading from that was about 10 times faster than reading from project B or from computing file system. Um, and there was, you know, a clog maybe in the project B or, or a community file system that was causing the IO to be much, much slower than uh, what we ought to saw in Luster. But the read-only file system was about the same speed as Luster was. Interesting, that's so, yeah, that's a, that's a good tip. And that's, um, that, that's one of the file systems, it's a JGI specific file system, right? Right, right. Uh, Project DNA is, is our read-only file system. It can't, it can't be written to from the nodes, um, but you can read from it. It was much, much faster than Project B. Yeah, yeah, that's a good tip. The, I guess the equivalent in a way um, across the, the wider um, you know, NERSC community is for if you are um, building software for your group to use, the uh, global common was it global common software and your project name directory is is similarly mounted read only on the compute nodes and it should uh, give a, you know, a little better performance for you know, uh, starting the software particularly on lots of nodes and I think part of the reason is to do with the ability 
better ability to uh, to do caching on the nodes and on the way through. Well, well yeah, Doug yeah, no, just put something in the chat that says something to that um, where if a GPFS file system is mounted read only, then um, it can use all the um, servers um, to distribute the load, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, yep. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, that's a, a really good tip. Thanks, Rob. Well, well so, so I mean, that, that leads into a suggestion that it might be useful to have a read only mount available uh, for applications to use the read only portion of it if they only need to read from the data. So a, a read only of which? Well, well of, of uh, so, so for all the GPFS file systems, it might be useful to have an extra read only copy, you know, mounted so that one could read uh, from it quickly. Oh yeah, that would that, that would be an interesting thought to explore. Could we could we use um, yeah more read only file systems? So uh, if you don't mind me jumping in, I can I can at least speak to it a little bit. Um, sure. Part of, part of the reason this works well for JGI is that JGI has one place that can write to that file system, and we've communicated very carefully that no one should ever change a file that might be accessed on um, on Cori in a job that's running. Um, and that's because of this very aggressive caching and the non-awareness that a given IO thread will have relative to another one. Uh, so if you make a change to a file while a node is reading it, you can actually get files that never existed with these read-only mounts. It's it's really cool, but also if you're not very, very, very careful with your, with this new non POSIX IO capability that DVS can deliver, uh, it is a lot faster. It's much, much faster. It, it, you know, POSIX IO is, is is damaging in some ways to HPC performance, so it's worth it. But it takes a great deal of care and and planning and preparedness. Uh, and I I think it's a great idea. I just I've always been confused about how to best communicate that. It's been a little easier with JGI, um, but yeah. Yeah, that's really good to know. Thanks, thanks Rob and Doug. Any other kind of uh, hot tips? Hi, this is Stephen Bailey. Um, related to IO, I found one of the most effective ways to move data around internally to NERSC is to use Globus. Um, so, you know, it's a website in Chicago or something for moving data between, um, you know, Scratch and CFS, for example. Um, that's, you know, far faster than rsync or just copy. Um, but a limiting factor until very recently was that it didn't work with a collaboration account. It only worked with individual accounts because of how you have to authenticate. But yesterday, Lisa got us set up so that we can now use our DESI collaboration account um, to authenticate with Globus and move the data around with a custom endpoint. Um, and so that's really great and opens up more possibilities for us to use it for doing productions between the two. So thanks, Lisa. And if you're a user and haven't used Globus to move data internal to NERSC, consider it. Cool, yeah, that's a, that's a really good tip actually. Um, even, even for users who are not using a collaboration account, uh, the idea that, or the, the, the mechanism of using Globus to move data around even internally to NERSC is, uh, is very valuable. Globus is a really nice tool, actually. I, I quite like it. It's great for moving stuff around between sites as well and being able to um, you know, set up kind of a fire and forget for a, a large transfer is, is pretty handy too. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, can I ask a uh, kind of question about the Globus? Sure. Uh, this is Coach again. Uh, so I'm using Globus to transfer uh, files externally from other systems to NASC. And during yep. uh, this transmission, if I look at the event log on Globus website, they sometimes say some uh, error messages like timeout error or file system does not allow append. But in the end, when I just wait for enough time, uh, all the files are copied and there's no you know, problems in, in all the files. So eventually, without doing nothing from my side, it just works. 
and I am just curious then what are those error messages and it's coming looks like it's coming from the, uh, the NASC uh, endpoint and this is a case when I use Globus to NASC HPSS uh, NASC HPSS endpoint yeah right. um, I wonder if this is common I did transfer a, quite a amount of data in the last few weeks and many times I see these errors, but eventually it just works fine. I wonder if that's the case for other people or most of the users. Steve, maybe I can comment on that? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a specific peculiarity with how Globus interacts with HPSS. Mm. Um, it, Globus normally will um, split your files up into multiple streams and then send them over the wide area network and then stitch them back together at the other end. Um, but because of the way that HPSS works, the software, you can't do that. It's a single stream. Um, and so you can't resume an interrupted transfer that gets blocked uh, for HPSS, for instance. Um, so that's what that file does not allow append message means. It means you got interrupted midway through Globus tried to resume and the software at the end of HPSS said, no, do start over again. Uh, so one of the things that we recommend if you're trying to transfer lots and lots and lots of data to HPSS is that you do a, a two-step transfer. You go to CFS or Scratch first mm -hmm. here and then use HSR or HTAR to put them in. But that's, you know, that's if you're doing like lots and lots, like terabytes and terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data transfer. Um, because of this, these resumes can be kind of bothersome for large data. But um, otherwise, if it's just a small amount, um, as, you, as you've seen, Globus will just try again and it just takes a little bit longer and it eventually gets in there. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for the recommendation. That yeah, sense. that's helpful. So, so I think I got two take homes from that. One was that when you see these messages, don't panic, the transfer succeeds in the end, it's not broken. And the other is that if you're seeing them a lot, which is more likely to happen with really large transfers and particularly to HPSS, uh, doing, doing a two-step transfer where you first transfer to C-Scratch or CFS should avoid them. Did that summarize it correctly, Lisa? Yeah, sounds great. Cool, thank you. Cool, thank you. So I guess one more today I learned from the NERSC side of things. And I guess this was, well, I certainly learned it and I guess others did as well. Um, when we were working with Corey in read-only mode and you know, I think uh, <laughs> our users helped a bit in discovering this. Yeah, we, we found a few things where we have uh, dependencies on Scratch and um, in at least some of the cases, we're able to mitigate those. Some some of them were, you know, we can flag to look at in more detail. So, uh, yeah, for instance, um, uh, Shifter uses C Scratch for uh, some of its staging of images. And that one that one will take a, a little bit more of a run up to, uh, you know, to uh, work around. I guess for times C Scratch is not available. Um, I think you know a few people noticed when we first went into the kind of uh, debug mode where C-Scratch was unavailable, there were some issues with logins hanging and our systems group was able to, you know, make some changes re reasonably quickly to you know, decouple that particular reliance on, you know, something in the dot files that was looking at C-Scratch. So it was, uh, it, it's, it's been a, a good month of learning. So our next item on the agenda is announcements and calls for participation. So we have a few of these from the NERSC side, um, and then we'll kind of open the floor for uh, announcements from users. So this is kind of an opportunity to, you know, if you're um, hosting a conference, for instance, um, you know, or a, or a you know, meeting or events that other users might be interested in participating, this is a, a good opportunity to announce them. Uh, so first of all, there's a few that were in the weekly email, so you should be able to dig this up in the email or on the announcements page at www.nurse.gov. Um, so the schedule maintenance for Corey for October has been cancelled. 
Uh, there's an upcoming parallelware training. I forgot to write the actual date that that is, but there's information and, and how to register for it in the weekly email. Uh, those of us who were at last month's meeting would have seen uh, Zinji's presentation about uh, checkpoint restart on Corey. And during that, she made the first announcement of uh, a new conference, the first international symposium on checkpointing for supercomputing, SuperCheck 21. And so there's a, uh, a CFP for that and yeah, links to it through the weekly email. Uh, also, if you're interested in being part of the HPC community kind of in a, in a wider sense, the SC21 um, committee, steering committee, uh, has a call for planning committee volunteers that's currently open. And we have a, a very new announcement that will uh, send something around in a little bit more detail shortly, but uh, we'll have a, a pause of the job queue and C Scratch will be temporarily unavailable for a few hours on Monday morning while we add a new ADU. And we'll actually talk a little bit about what that means uh, very shortly um, to help with debugging from you know, the outcomes of the, uh, the file system crash that we experienced at the end of last month. Uh, another big one, kind of, I think you've probably seen this a little bit already on the nurse um, users Slack channel. Uh, it's also been in the weekly emails. And this will soon become the default thing, but we really encourage people to try it out. We have a new help portal for our uh, ticket system that uh, gets you yeah, fairly quickly and easily to uh, tickets, to documentation, and to common requests. It's got a, a fairly decent search bar, a much more user-friendly user interface. And you know, when you do open a ticket, it goes through to a much more um, what do you call it, usable form for doing so. so. So we think this is a great improvement and um, we're really keen to have users try it out and you know, tell us any kind of your issues or glitches that you notice. Um, yeah, and we're uh, hoping to make this the, you know, the live destination for help.nurse.gov quite soon now. So it's at uh, nurse.servicenowservices.com slash SP for service portal. Probably easiest is the, there'll be a link or there is already a link to that in the um, general channel. And I went to the webinars channel of the nurse user Slack. Um, that's all the ones that I know about at the moment. Um, does anybody else have any announcements or calls for participation they'd like to make? Okay, if not, then we'll go on to our uh, topic of the day. So I think this is a, you know, a, a very topical one that um, people will be interested in. And um, I'm going to pass over to Doug Jacobson, who's the uh, lead of our computational systems group. So uh, he heads up the group that you know, sort of does the, the systems administration, if you like, for Corey and associated systems. And he has uh, quite a lot of uh, knowledge about you know, what happened and why, at least to the degree that we know. And uh, I will pass over to you, Doug. Um, are you able to share or do I need to ena enable something? Uh, I should be able to share. I think maybe you'll need to stop sharing. Yes, right. I think you need to stop and then I get to start. It's kind of funny because it'll be the same day. Stop share. There we go. All right, let me just find that particular window here it is can you confirm that that's the uh, slide that is working i even turn on closed captioning <laughs> oh good thought all right so um so what so so c, c, c scratch one crashed as you know and it caused the system uh, to be down quite a lot um, this last time. Now, I am happy to say that we found a way to remain 
in some form of operations. And we'll talk about what that means through most of this. But what, you know, so, so just sort of working through the slide a little bit um, to give you an idea of what actually happened. So the structure of the Lustre file system is such that it's comprised of about two, it's, it's com comprised of 258 servers. Um, and 248 of those store your data and uh, six of them store your metadata or manage the file system in some way. And then two of them manage the whole rest of that cluster. The, the actual file system is a cluster all of its own. That's the name Luster, sounds like cluster, right? Anyway, so when we look at the structure of the file system, we have sort of, you can sort of, the easiest way to think about it is to divide it into two groups of nodes. One is, is metadata nodes, data about your data, and the rest is, is object storage nodes, your data. And so the metadata nodes, these are the things that provide all of the structure of the file system that you see. When you change directories to global C scratch one SD slash your username, that uh, is all the work of the metadata server. When you type ls minus l or chmod uh, to change permissions um, or you move a file, you're talking to the metadata server. When you open a file or close a file, you're talking to the metadata server and then the metadata server is saying, and hey, look over here on this OSS to get that first block of data that you need. So that, that's, that's what the metadata server does, is it's really important because it is keeping track of what all the data on the file system is and where it is. One of the interesting features that we'll talk about uh, today is that with Luster, you can um, stripe the data. This, that is to say that you can say, you know, I don't want my, my entire file to be on, on the first OSS, I want, you know, I want it to stripe out over say four of them, in which case the first megabyte would be on the first OSS and then the second megabyte on the second OSS and the third megabyte and so on and so forth and stripe back and forth. There's actually a lot of really important benefits to doing that. Uh, one is that you get better performance because now four servers are talking to you instead of just one. But also if you're doing a sequential read of the, of the file, you actually um, are being uh, sort of, um, being a good citizen in many ways, because if uh, if you put it one single large file on the system, uh, that OSS will actually only talk to you, and that, that OSS can be completely taken over by your process trying to read that file. So striping also gives all of your neighboring users a chance to get their data as well. So you get better performance, and everybody else does too when we do striping. There's a reason I'm telling you about this, but okay. So what was happening uh, in this crash is that, uh, is that our metadata server was crashing. Now you'll see that we have a big metadata server and apparently a little metadata server. It's called a, an ADU, which stands for additional DNE unit, which as you may have noticed has a, a yet another acronym wrapped inside of it. And let's just not worry about that. The point is, is that these are other metadata servers. So when we created your Scratch directory here at NERSC, um, about 30% of you ended up uh, with all of your data on the primary MDS. And then the rest of folks um, end up getting sort of shunted off to this other ADU. Uh, and we have four of them. Um, unfortunately, in, in order to get to your, your directory, uh, in order to find slash global slash v slash one slash SD, up to that point, you've got to go through this one. So you, no matter what, even if you're in a little in one of these ADUs, you still have a dependency on the primary MDS, and it was the primary MDS that was crashing. So it's very, very disruptive. Okay. All right. Apparently, you don't get to click. Okay. So what actually happened? And actually, I happened to be on call uh, for almost this entire incident. So that was interesting. Uh, at least for the two production crashes. So on Thursday, September 24th, it crashed. And, you know, we've seen this before. Well, we've seen the metadata server crash. It's not great, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a very complex system comprised of very complex software and software sometimes has bugs. And so, you know, we filed the normal critical case that we would 
And unfortunately, when we tried to bring it back up, so we do have failover capabilities for all these servers, it couldn't fail over automatically. And that's because some of the safeguards to make sure that all the all the system data is, is secure and safe and well written out was damaged in this crash. That's the file system journal here. And so that forced us to go through several different runs of what's called an FSCK file system check and repair. And that takes, the, that's each FSCK takes eight, eight hours to run and to do it correctly for our system, we have to run it three different ways, three times. So that's 30, it basically takes 24 hours of checking. And if any errors come up, um, you know, then they, those have to be manually resolved. And so it ends up taking about 36 hours to recover from a metadata server crash where it can't fail over. It's quite disruptive. So we were very happy on Friday, we got to come back into production. And then on Sunday, it repeated again. Um, at the time, both of these were right around noon and we were assigning a lot of significance to it being around noon. <laughs> it ends up not being, as far as we know, that, that that's not the issue. Um, and so, you know, at this point we were nervous because it was exactly the same crash, um, in terms of, you know, we look at this, the, the Linux kernel, uh, stack trace, it was identical. And so the, the concern was is that some unknown, some unknown, uh, portion of the workload was sort of reproducibly touching this and would potentially put user data at, at risk. And so we didn't feel that we could bring the system back into production. Um, so we went through the crash, you know, through the repair again, but we didn't have any immediate direction forward. Um, on Tuesday, we worked out a plan uh, with HPE. Uh, HPE is our vendor that used to be called Cray, um, wherein um, the, the systems team, uh, my team, would basically completely rewrite all aspects of how the system is accessed. And so we put in a we put in a, a a big day, and we changed all the zone queues. We changed all the login policies. We changed every aspect of how people get in, in order to create this debug Corey capability, um, which we'll have at the ready if we ever need it again. But it's our goal to not. Um, and at the same time, HPE put together a special debug kernel that would help them to zero in on what was the problem. Um, and then finally, we were, uh, uh, some of the, some of my team was, and a lot of HPE was dedicated to trying to look at the actual crash memory dumps to try to understand what might be causing it. So we spent time putting together a reproducer workload, uh, with the goal of, you know, now that we have a debug kernel, we don't want to just, and we don't want to stay in debug query mode forever. So we need to start doing something. We need to take action in order to try to crash the machine. So it made it kind of weird that normally our goal is to uh, keep Corey up as, as well and efficiently as we can. And now our goal is to crash Corey as well and as efficiently as we could. And it took about uh, another 36 hours from Wednesday when we came back until Friday at, uh, at 8 a.m. Uh, to crash the system again. And so we reproduced it. Um, unfortunately, the journal was damaged again. And so it took another 36 hours to repair. Almost immediately after they repaired the journal, uh, we brought it back up on Sunday. We had a pretty good idea of what was going on that, on then, and so we tuned our reproducer and we crashed it in an hour and a half, and then another 36 hours to repair. Uh, during these times, uh, they're in yellow. What we did is we made Corey available without C Scratch One at all. Um, that's not to say that it was as useful as as, as normal, but um, at, the, at the very least, you know, some useful work could be done with the machine. And I believe that we made made that time available as free time. So that, that's always a nice thing. Um, and so what we changed when we got into, after we repaired it again, is that we, we removed everyone from the machine. And we did that so that we could produce, be sure that now that with your help, with all of the nurse user bases help had you know identified the correct workload we wanted to be sure that we could isolate it down to um, a particular synthetic workload um, at the same time hpe gave us some additional uh you know uh, capabilities with that debugging kernel 
uh, to try to uh, assure that the journal would not get corrupted. That did not happen, unfortunately. And so it once again took another 36 hours uh, to repair the disk, actually a little longer that time because of some complications that came up. But in any case, um, on, on Thursday the 8th, we decided to return to normal production. What we did is, is that we took our reproducer workload and we ran it without the uh, secret ingredient <laughs> that we figured out we, that we think was, is at least associated with it. And by doing that, we were able to show that we can run the system at extremely high load. So normally, you know, so when we were doing these reproducers, we were running Corey's metadata servers at about 15 times uh, the typical load that it operates at. Um, and so load alone is not the crashing uh, sort of uh, associated uh, issue. Um, so that gave us the confidence we needed so that basically as long as we avoid the thing that hurts, um, we won't, you know, we won't crash. And, and we've been working very carefully with a number of people to try to make sure that we avoid that behavior. Okay, so what, what, what did we get out of all this? Um, so there is no root cause yet. We don't know exactly what this is, is causing this. We're sure of a couple things. One is that this is a bug and it's a bug at the kernel layer, uh, the Linux kernel layer. Now that could be in a kernel module like Lustre, or it could be deep in the IO um, subsystems itself. Uh, these, uh, the, the Cori Scratch system runs a modified version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. So it's not, it's, it's, it is modified, but it's not super modified. So, you know, it's a well-tested kernel. Um, highly regarded as being reliable. So that should be generally okay. Um, however, what, you know, like I told you, we were doing some pretty deep investigation of these memory dumps. And what we found is that the, so we were getting an, a very consistently um, that the, va the specific invalid value was changing a little tiny bit, uh, but it was always a very specific pointer. Um, in a, in a very low level IO data structure. So a data structure that was, you know, basically about to be written to disk. Um, there, that, that does it sort of imply a couple different methods for how it might be getting modified. The details don't actually matter here, but the point is that, is that it's very sort of deterministic. It's always the same crash, it's not random. Um, and we found when we looked at the pages that were modified, as being associated with those IO structures, uh, they, they did reveal a particular application um, as being correlated. Um, and that really sped us along in terms of identifying that reproducer stack. Um, and so what the application was doing um, is just performing um, a lot of unlink operations in parallel. And in the, the particularly unique item here is that this is happening when the file is striped over many, many OSTs, so basically all of them. And this was not an intentional configuration. Um, however, and I just want to stress that there's nothing wrong with what this application was doing. It just happens to be that it's tickling this bug. So um, no problem there. Uh, we're going to solve it. We're going to fix the bug. Uh, we're still not going to recommend that workload, though. <laughs> but. Uh, so the specific mechanism of how this workload is causing the corrupted pointer is unknown. We do not know. Neither does HPE, but they're working on it. And they've got a lot of people dedicated to this project. And uh, throughout this incident, I was talking to them every single day, sometimes twice a day, as were a lot of people at NERSC. And at this time, we are still meeting with them uh, three times a week uh, while we're sort of moving to the next phase. We'll talk a little bit about that. But based on what... Uh, what we learned there is that it's somehow tied to using many, many OSTs. And if I have to, if I'm forced to speculate, there's a couple different paths that have been discussed. One is that when the stripe count is extremely high, um, extended attribute inode blocks must be used. And it may be that this is related. Um, that in some way, when doing deletions, uh, pulling in these additional um, extended attribute blocks may, may generate the, the kind of race that we're seeing. Another possibility is that um, there's a, a big dramatic increase in the complexity of messaging when deleting files, um, when you have to talk to a lot of OSTs and maintain locks. Um, so 
you know, very naively, we think that it's completely safe to use one stripe or two stripes, and there's clearly some risk at using 248 stripes. Um, it's hard to know what the distribution is within there, but everything that we know tells us that using our um, our, our largest recommended size is uh, the so-called stripe large that's in our documentation. That's a stripe count of 72. It should be safe. However, for the time being, we're asking people to not stripe higher than 272. Okay, so to avoid this, uh, like I said, we're avoiding high stripe counts. Um, this is a general request of all users. Um, we are working on a file system scan to detect both the high stripe counts so that we can directly contact users, but also to identify damaged um, inodes uh, that were triggered during this. I am happy to say that almost everything we're finding is in my directory where we ran the reproducers or in uh, some of the other known uh, places that were associated uh, with, this, with this issue. Um, there have been a couple of other uh, user files and we'll talk about what the recovery will be for them. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the message that we want to send is contact us if you see something weird with the file system. Uh, HP uh, has options and can work with us on each, each and everything. Um, and very important to understand is that there is no user workflow that's actually causing this. The error is deeper in the system. Um, and like I said, for now, our goal is to avoid these conditions. So there have been a couple of after effects. And one thing I want to be clear about is that we actually don't know that this is related to the crash. Uh, but people have noticed that since we came back into production, sometimes login nodes will hang. And by hang, perhaps you were trying to access a file on, on C Scratch 1. Perhaps you were trying to LS. Perhaps you were trying to submit a job, because submitting a job actually talks to Lesser to check your quota. Um, and in some cases, that just doesn't work anymore. What we found is that the Lustre client can only handle a limited number of simultaneous change requests to the metadata server. And it's possible that there is uh, accessing one of these damaged files may be generating, you know, basically be deadlocking one of those, um, one of those potential RPCs. Um, that's unclear. It, it could just be a different bug, but so we don't we don't know if it's related or not. Uh, but they happen one after the other, so we we're sort of it's hard to not assume that they're related to each other. Um, as a mitigation, what we're doing is we are monitoring uh, the number of RPCs in flight and try and then using a number of techniques to try to identify a login node that's impacted and we'll try to reboot it as soon as we identify that it's failed. The idea being is that at that point, we know that login node is no longer useful for submitting jobs, it's no longer useful for accessing scratch, it's no longer useful for data transfer. And so it'd be better if we just cra you know, crash it as soon as possible and get that, get that debugging information over to Cray. Um, the correction you know, will sort of depend on what the problem is. Uh, if it is related to the damaged files, then the check and repair of Lustre, which is at a different layer than the check and repair of the metadata service system, uh, will complete over the next uh, week or so. And in that time, we should, we should know more. Um, if, it's, if it's related to a, a bug in the client, then we may need to install a patch in order to fix that. And we'll identify the right way to do that once we've worked this out. Um, so that, that's one thing. Um, another is that uh, some, a very few people um, have identified that they can't look at their files. If you try to ls minus l, you might see all question marks for the mode of the file um, or the size. And if you try to delete it, it says it's not a, it's not a, it's not a file or directory, which is kind of weird. Um, you can move its parent directory around, uh, but you can't move the file. You can't rename it. Um, we are working with HP to repair and recover those, um, but the best thing to do for now is just to rename the directory they're in or just ignore that they exist. Um, we are working to build a scan. It takes about two weeks to complete, and the scanning server is having the same problem that the login nodes are, so it it hangs from time to time. We have to restart the scan from that point. 
if you have any questions, please go to ServiceNow at help.nurse.gov to file a ticket. Okay, so this, uh, I, I want to point out that I'm, 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 you know, like Lisa, many people have been working on many different aspects of this. I'm just sort of reporting it. <laughs> so, okay, so debugging this has been, has been extremely challenging and we have to fix it. Um, because you know this, you know we 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 don't know. You know we've identified one way this bug can happen, but we don't know that this is all the ways that this bug can happen. And so, you know, what are we what are we doing right now? So one thing that we've been doing the whole time is we've been trying to re reproduce this at a smaller scale. As it's become increasingly clear that the number of OSTs seems to help it's becoming very unlikely that we can reproduce this on our small test system, which only has four OSTs. So that's probably not gonna work. So we're gonna have to use Cori. Um, the next problem is that it's a very long debug cycle. It takes about um, 36 hours for us to cr boot the system, crash, crash the system and then repair it. But it takes even longer for HPE to analyze all the results at the level of verbosity and complexity of the debugging kernels that they're building. So crashing the whole MDT is not actually a useful activity at this point. Um, it's disruptive to you, and um, and it's not getting us the, the the type of iteration set time that we need. And with so many with such a complex system, uh, we need to basically be able to do a lot of very rapid. Um, uh, well-designed experiments to try to start teasing out what is the fundamental issue. Uh, in addition, there are lots of people involved. So there's been about um, about 30 HPE engineers involved, uh, about 20 NERSC engineers involved in this effort, um, all trying to understand this. And of course, in the early phases of this, we heavily involved um, the, 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 the very wide NERSC user base and you know, more recently have been seeking detailed expertise in some, some areas from some of you. Um, so that's been really important, that level of engagement. We want to say thank you for that. Um, so we are, we, we, we are running instrumented kernels to tr in case something crashes now, but more importantly, um, we, HPE is sending us a new metadata server. Oh, oops. Um, a, a so-called ADU, this is one of the small ones, um, that we will use uh, to isolate just this workload. Um, this should allow us to take um, about uh, 200 nodes of Cori, we suspect, um, plus that ADU, plus a little tiny slice of all the OSSs uh, to then uh, crash just that ADU. And since no other user data will be on it, that will have two important aspects. One is that it will be very quick to repair because it won't have like 2 billion files on it. Second, um, it won't have any of your data on it. So you won't notice it. Um, and it won't cause logins to hang or anything else. So that's our plan. In order to get that done, we actually just today, right after the, the great shakeout completed, you know, after the HP engineers were able to uh, get out from under the table, they were able to then install the new ADU. It just came today. Um, and it's been installed into our data center and into C Scratch One. But we can't add it to the, to, to the system until we can quiesce the whole C Scratch One. And so on Monday morning at 7 a.m., uh, we're going to, we're not going to reboot Cori, but we're going to stop all the jobs and we're going to lie, we're going to kill all of the login sessions again. We're going to unmount C Scratch One, and we're going to add this new ADU, and then at that point we can begin the debugging uh, experiment um, alongside all of everyone else's work. As, so, let's open this up for questions. We've got four different people on the phone today to help answer your questions. Myself, Lisa, Alberto, and Steve. Any questions? I also see there's a, a few other NERSC people online, um, and we've got we've got about five minutes left and the last two items in the meeting, I think we can shoot through in the space of about half a minute. So, so we'll have about five minutes for Q and A. And I have time in addition. I don't know if that's okay, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, um, can I just start with very uh, just clarification uh, question about this just one acronym I saw in the uh, few slides back. Uh, it's RPC. What does RPC means? I think you mentioned that when we. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't define that. That's a remote procedure call. So okay. in any sort of distributed system like this, in order to basically ask another computer to do a thing, there's a general term called remote procedure call, RPC. Okay. And that happens whenever we submit a job or access a Scratch system? Yes, absolutely. So anytime that you ask to open a file, that's going to send an RPC to the metadata server. And then the metadata server will then send more to the OSSs. When you go to submit a, a job to the system, uh, SBatch will submit an RPC to the Silicon Controller net, uh, software to add that job. Um, so actually, I, I tend to think about file systems in Slurm in a very similar manner. They, they, solve, they don't solve the same problem, but they use very similar techniques. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question about the hanging login notes. Um, I understand there's good reasons that when you log in to NERSC that they tend to send you to the same login note as that you were on last time. But if that login note is hanging and you're not uh, yet noticed it and haven't rebooted it yet, is there a way that I can clear the history so I get a random login note? So at this, so so I'm going to answer both your question. I'm going to answer the question that you asked as well as the question that it, that I that it implies to me. In the, so, so uh, the the short answer is is that um, it's based on your IP address, and so unless you can change your IP address, it's not going to be easy to change to a different login node. Okay. However, what we can do and what we have done is that the load balancer, that's a particular piece of hardware. That's why it's, you know, it's, it's configurability. Every time we, every time we, I, I'm nervous about touching that, that particular piece of hardware because every time we do it, it seems to, seems to generate a, a new exciting, a new excitement for us. But what, what it does is it talks to each of our login servers every couple seconds and says, are you up? Are you up? Are you up? Are you up? And we've never done much with that up or down check until now. And so we identified two different ways um, that we can see if, if the scratch is, if, if, the, if the mount point to scratch is hung without blocking that process. One is, is looking for a well-known um, login process that can hang. Um, that's the thing that you're noticing you're getting hung on. And if we see five copies of those that are still in the process table, so we can check the process table without getting hung up, so to speak, then what we will do is we will mark the node as down so that way you even if you were assigned to it once we once it's marked down in the load balancer no new sessions will go there like right. i said that is happening every two seconds okay and then the second thing that we did is we also we were able to under identify a signature at the luster layer itself so that we're not waiting for users to necessarily uh you know walk you know walk in the front door and find an unwelcome environment where you know that's now responding to activity that was already on the login node and already you know, already failing, um, and we're marking the node down in that case. And then finally, what we've done is, is that we've engaged our 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 operation staff. You know, we have site site reliability engineers that that, that work twenty four seven at NERSC, and they are um, they are now monitoring very carefully uh, for this 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 new health check, and they. Uh, and they are empowered to reboot these nodes as soon as they notice that it's happening. It still has to be a manual process because we need to collect debugging information in order to solve the problem. But the during daylight hours from well, from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, this is an urgent issue for us. And overnight, uh, it's handled uh, only a couple times. Okay, thanks. You're very welcome. So we've officially got about one minute left. Uh, Doug indicated that he can uh, stay on the meeting for a little bit longer. Uh, I can stay on a bit longer and, and a few others might be able to as well. Uh, what we might do though is I'll just reshare this screen. We'll quickly run through the last couple of items and then return to Q&A and people are free to uh, uh, stay and go according to their schedule. 
So the last couple of items we have uh, coming up. Um, third Thursday, we're interested in topic requests and suggestions, uh, but I think we can take this offline and please make, make suggestions or requests on the NERSC Slack, uh, particularly the webinars channel. And the other item that we finish up on is um, last month's numbers. So for September, you can see that Corey's scheduled availability yeah, took a bit of a hit for reasons that we've been talking about. HPSFs and CFS uh, were still all very good in the timeline. Uh, it looks like this. And of course, the crash ran over the end of the month. So uh, I expect that we'll see another lower than usual number in for October's numbers next month as well. So we can return to Q&A at this point and uh, thank you all for joining us and you know those who have uh, other other commitments um, please feel free to leave as needed. Okay, um, can I ask another more general question? Uh, um, yeah. So about this Corey's issue is quite special and not really having took place so frequently in the past, I, I believe, but still uh, maybe could happen in, in, in the future, something similar. But so I was wondering if this incident can affect the future planning of computing systems in in particular in my uh i am wondering if we change this so right now my understanding is the given the space at nursk we can install two big systems like cori or parameter i guess so when we you know change one of the two like Edison and Parameter, we have to decommission the old one and move away, make a space, and then move into the, the new system. So while we are doing that, we have only one system. And if something like that happens to one system, then it uh, affects users' uh, productivity quite a bit. But uh, if, I don't know, if we have enough space to have another more intermediate uh, systems, that's not maybe too big, but uh, many of our, our application doesn't really need that much big uh, systems, even though that helps queuing, but uh, our job itself that doesn't really need too big uh, systems. So maybe during the daytime, uh, during the you know, standard time, that's more like for analysis or smaller jobs. And then we separate maybe Scott system just like Ed, uh, Edison and Corey used to be. And uh, in that direction, that might give more resiliency to the overall uh, system. So, um, yeah, uh, that's sort of what, I, what I'm feeling. Um, but having said that, I really appreciate the, how you guys put back Corey to the uh, product uh, production, at least without even without accessing Scott space. Actually, that two weeks made me able to do some analysis and, and uh, put up the presentation, which I made in this week's Tuesday. So we are having PI meeting this week for one of the Office Science uh, RGN program. And uh, it really made one nice slide in the last three days before the, the conference. I really appreciate that. But anyway, yeah. Uh, but that's yeah something I thought, and I was wondering what would you thought for the future uh, planning of NASC system? So, um, so I, what I can say is that, um, you know, clearly this is a, this, this was a major bug um, and it's a bug at a very deep layer of the machine. Um, it is challenging to predict exactly the, the we, we're working very carefully with 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 our vendor and internally on sort of crafting our our longer term plan as as a result. Um, resiliency for Perlmutter is going is is a central goal for that system. The way that I'd like to phrase it is that our goal for for Perlmutter is is continuous operations. So you know, short of you know a a facility outage. 
you know, like we have to shut down the power because of a PSPS event, you know, or something, or one of these facility. Anyway, uh, you know, our goal will be to try to keep Promoter online to some level. Now, I also recognize, though, that this particular bug is, is, is I'm hoping <laughs> that it's a once in a lifetime per system type bug. And so I, you know, I, I, I'm just, I, 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 I basically we, we're trying to balance sort of, you know, what is the, you know, trying to balance sort of, you know, the, the risk versus, um, versus resiliency, uh, because we can't be resilient to all possible things. Um, that said, I do also like it when we have two systems. <laughs> Um, exactly for the reasons that you talk about. Um, Corey and Perlmutter are going are fundamentally different systems as well. So um, Edison and Corey, uh, while they have different processing elements, you know, uh, IV bridge versus KNL, and of course, very different scales, the way that we operate them was identical. In fact, we used identical software uh, for both machines um, from a system layer. And so it really gave us a nice A, B test strategy. Bring it to Edison, let it hang out for a little while. And then that said, this isn't thought to be a result of an upgrade. Uh, this is thought to be more of a bug that's always been there and was expressed by a change in the workload. Um, so these, these kinds of things um, will be hard at this scale to avoid in the long term. So anyway, I hear you. Um, and I just want to assure you that we're thinking about different ways of, of, of dealing with these types of things in the future. OK, thank you. OK. Hi, uh, this is Ramesh from, from Argon. And I am doing some computations on, on Corey. And uh, during the course of my conversations on chat, I was actually chatting with somebody at at NERSC, when you had had this problem with your file system initially, about a month month ago. And uh, we were actually just comparing notes because I'm from Argon. I'm familiar with a system which is fairly similar to Corey, the Theta system over here. We have recently upgraded our operating system. And before we upgraded, upgraded the operating system, uh, there were a couple of occasions when I had seen issues similar to what you are seeing now uh, with, with Corey. So the suggestion that I had made was that, you know, perhaps some of you might want to actually contact the ALCF folks just to see if there was something that they did which could help with, uh, with the situation that you're facing, which also primarily seems to stem from the own killer associated with Luster, the file system. So it, it, it just a just a suggestion. I thought I'd just mention this. I'm 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 sure you're far more conversant with what you're doing than anything I suggest. I'll tell you. So thanks, Ramesh. So so you're talking about uh, it, this is the the login hangs or C scratch issues or a different issue. Well, there were there were login hangs. So one of the symptoms I did notice at my end, uh, of course, uh, let me also preface this by saying that I'm a recent user of Cori. I've been on Cori for about a month now. And because we have a, a DOE BER stimulus funded COVID-19 project, which has some fairly aggressive timelines and I'm trying to get some of those computations done on Cori because uh, I just can't do it on Theta. So I have to do it on, on Corey. So in the, in the course of those interactions with Corey, in a manner of speaking, LS was one problem that I did notice because LS was hanging. Another problem that I had initially noticed was that I was actually not able to submit my job at all. And that was actually a problem with, uh, with, with I think, the, uh, the job scheduler and which in turn, uh, affect the job scheduler, which in turn was affected because there was a, there was a problem with the, with the file system, so. Very close. However, um, we, yeah. the, the job scheduler doesn't actually talk at all to, 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 to the lustre, but what does is SBatch itself. 
Correct. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm just. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just... <laughs> Sorry, with S patch. Uh, my bad. I, I was using the wrong, ter wrong terminology. Sorry. But yeah, that that's done as a. It's been. It's it's not. In order to implement, yes, there's a there's a lot of sort of initial login processes and 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 job initialization processes. That, that check your quotas and things like that, or assure that you have a, a scratch directory. And those are the things that can that, that get sort of jammed up uh, when C scratch one is, is unavailable. Uh, that is a rare occurrence when it's unavailable, but because of the issues we've been having, it's not been so rare. Uh, a thing that I haven't talked about, uh, but you know, we are working on removing at the very least the uh, the login hang um, if C Scratch One is 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 not available. Uh, that will not be, of course, in the October maintenance because we don't have one. But my expectation is that in the November maintenance, we will have a different mechanism for dealing with with logins in Scratch. Okay. Okay. The other thing I thought I would mention was that um, initially when I had gotten on to the Cori, I was experimenting a bit with file striping. And of course I had actually used the striping script that you actually have. I, I, didn't, I didn't stripe as wide as 272. It was far more nominal than that, just to see how my write speeds would, would improve. Um, and I was wondering if it's still okay to do that or uh, you, you don't want us to use those scripts at all with regard to striping. The scripts are still good. Um, They're still good, okay. okay. Yeah, so, so the scripts only go up to stripe large, which is a striping of 72. So, so we, cool. we kind of ask that you don't stripe more than that because you know, there's, a, there's an increased risk with, with increasing yeah. the script, the, the stripe further. Yeah. But, but we're, we're pretty comfortable with that. Okay, okay. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. So we're getting close to 12.15 now and it sounds like the, the rate of questions is diminishing. Um, we can also yeah, continue conversing via the webinars channel on the nurse user Slack. But perhaps at this point we'll wind up this. Is there a, just okay. a very quick question: Is there a particular channel on the NERSC Slack that uh, we we could talk to you, or is it just general? Uh, so, so NERSC actually only informally monitors the the NERSC Slack. So it's not actually an official support channel. We we kind of yeah you know, encourage users to chat via it because that you know. As, as good for interaction that uh, enables our user community to, you know, help each other a bit. And, um, you know, we, we do sort of check in on it occasionally to see if there's any, yeah, to see what, what is going okay. on. Um, there is a channel called hashtag webinars that we set up particularly for, um, yeah, for conversations around this meeting. Uh -huh. um, the, most sort of general Q and A that I see seems to land in the general channel, and there's a, a handful of channels that are a little bit more either project or software specific, but the the general channel is probably a good place to start. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, everyone, and we shall uh, see you next month.